most transformative thing in my life in terms of my meditation practice, learning how to deal with um, both, um, not just, you know, the feel good and, and loving aspect of things, but also being a witness to suffering in ourselves and others. And, and um, so the more work I've done with that in my personal meditation practice, the more beneficial it's been to me. And I've also been involved in developing um, training programs around that, such as the one we developed at Stanford, um, an eight-week compassion training program. Mm -hmm. So I do a lot of work with meditation. I study emotion and meditation scientifically as well. I've done research on meditation. And it was through that kind of stuff, the emotion, the meditation, and also being part of a psychedelic community that I got interested in psychedelic harm reduction. And one of my um, colleagues in the meditation research field, longtime colleagues, Catherine McLean, also has, you know, became, after she left Davis, went on to do a postdoc in psilocybin research at Johns Hopkins. And that's sort of how I got connected to psychedelic science through you, Catherine. Uh-huh. And, and um, started getting involved in work, um, volunteer work with harm reduction at places like Burning Man with the Zendo Project, as you can see. The Zendo, the Zendo Project. Project. The Zendo Project. The Zendo Project is a project of MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Science. And Zendo Project is it's her, psychedelic harm reduction. Um, we're present mm -hmm. at um, many gatherings like Burning Man. and um, So by harm reduction, you mean this is kind of uh, like an extension of what uh, like Rock Med used to do, like when people would like be having bad trips and they would talk people down. But this is like a more advanced science of that. Well, it's, I wouldn't call it an advanced science of it. it it's, it's a slightly different container for some of that. It's uh -huh. providing a safe space for people if they're having a challenging um, uh, psychedelic or actually other kind of experience, people walk in the doors and they're having a, an emotional difficulty. They, we will sit with them too. You know, it's not. Just, but it started from we have these gatherings going on. People are using psychedelics, and the medicalization of that experience can actually be very traumatic. Uh -huh. You know, you're, you're sitting there. Um, sometimes in a clinical setting, I'm not just talking about rock med, but a lot of gatherings, you might end up in a clinical setting and going through mm -hmm. a real difficult time and um, that's not the optimal environment to be in. I see incipient speech in you. What? Yeah. Um, <laughs> in, in my face? You see incipient speech on my face? See that you had something to I say. Was, I, I, just, I, was at I was at Lollapalooza one year and I broke my foot and I ended up in the medical tent and I was the only one not tripping. And so it became my job to kind of hobble around and hang out with the trippers yeah. because they were scaring the doctors and vice versa. And it was like, you know, there was a lot of like, you know, we know he doesn't get it. We know the doctor doesn't really understand what's happening. But so we got to help him out. <laughs> it was a lot of, a lot of that kind of stuff. Well, and, the, 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 what that speaks to is that's not the right place to be. Exactly. You know? And on, on and, and it's, and so what we do with Zen though is we um, create a space that's safe. We um, remove it from the medicalization. We um, have people who are there to be with you, and it's not a matter of talking down. It's um, being there while you go through it and being <laughs> supportive. And I'm, you know. What are you doing? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just getting a microphone just to make sure we have better sound. Yeah. But people can hear us now. We're being loud. Okay. So. Okay. But so, yeah. It's so. a live show. Mm -hmm. We have no production values. And <laughs> the I am, harm reduction I'm, is... I'm, I'm, I'm the crew and the uh, the producer and the host. So that's... <laughs> Welcome so, to the Dead Headland Show, ladies and gentlemen. So it's also sort of... There's like a harm reduction model for this show. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, it's just, so, but yeah, we just, we just keep on going. And we're changing the wheels as the bus is, is rolling. But, um, well, you know, I had this experience myself one time when I was uh, at a further concert in uh, one of the casinos in Vegas. Ooh, and right um, there. <laughs> yeah, and I, I was having a bad experience primarily related to um, having driven in the heat in the desert and eaten um, something I probably shouldn't have. And I was, like, just not feeling yeah. well, a little heat. So I went in the bathroom and relieved myself as a human being does. And, uh, you know... I guess I was making sounds that sounded like I was sick, so they sent in, like, medics, and they wouldn't let me go back into the concert because this is the casino and the way they handle things, so they took me over to their medical area. Now, I was not um, tripping, and I was not... I was just having, like, a seriously bad food reaction, and I had to throw up, and... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but they were treating it like a medical emergency. They wouldn't let me go back in the show, so when they take me in there, 
there's this girl clearly way high on psychedelics having mm-hmm. a bad experience and they're treating her like they keep like flashlights in her eye and they have her strapped down to a gurney and she's freaking out and all she wants to do is contact her friends mm-hmm. and I'm thinking her friends are probably if not they're not worried about her now they're going to be extremely worried about her at some point in the evening mm-hmm. and they're getting her prepped to take her off to a hospital in oh, an ambulance and yeah. I just felt and I'm trying I'm trying to talk to her and they're like sir 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 she's not your problem and I'm trying to tell her like it's going to be okay and can you tell me your friends names and mm-hmm. they wouldn't let me I'm like, seriously, I can probably try to contact, like, oh, it's just so horrible how they're dealing with it, you know? What came up and for so, me is, don't tell me who's not my problem. Yeah. Like, everybody here is my problem. So, right, right. But that's like, in, and so that's in a place where they're dealing it with it with no consciousness whatsoever. That's the prevailing. And, I mean, that's, um, that's and, usually the situation. So, so what's interesting to me, and uh, I don't know if we need the microphone or not, but I'm getting it ready to plug in, and hopefully that'll give us a little better sound, but then it's directional. But anyways, what what is that the fact that... Um, Mushrooms and other psychedelics have been um, reduced in priority. They haven't ever been legalized, really, but like in Colorado and then in Oakland and I guess some other places where it's just like it is no longer a law enforcement priority, which is well, a decriminalization, if nothing else. It's they, the, uh, the plants like in Oakland and in, I don't know, if it, is it the whole, it's the whole state of Cal- Colorado? The or city of Denver. City of Denver. City of Denver. Have decriminalized plants like plant-based psychedelics so it's not all psychedelics right, right. plants uh, this doesn't include lsd no no but yeah. it's it's the plant-based things, yeah, the mushrooms yeah. and ayahuasca right, and right. i mean we could argue dmt yeah. other things i guess it all depends on what form you're taking it in but uh none of it's been tested in a court situation yet but yeah. my my point being in bringing this up is that that that's a step in harm reduction a great societal step in harm reduction right. um yeah. that's where that comes from if not from a city, it might say, oh, well, it's saving money or it's not, you know, an important crime or whatever. But that's really like when we stop treating people like first off they're criminals and first off they've done something wrong. That's the first step to to transforming a psychedelic experience from what could be a bad trip and actually be something that could be emotionally scarring to someone that could actually be a healing experience that could actually help them work through something really huge. You well, know, by you just, read? that's partially giving them the space. Have you read the law? For, the de- law. for decriminalized Oakland. No, I have not. The resolution that they wrote at Decriminalized Nature Oakland, I, I you ca- you guys can find it. It's easy to search. It's lovely. It's gorgeous. And it, and it speaks <laughs> to the sacredness and the beauty and the relationship with nature and things like this. Like it, it was, It's really well written and speaks to the fact that, you know, these plants are actually don't necessarily cause harm in the way people have been saying. And they do cause amazing benefit. And, and to have that kind of thing written and ratified into law. That is, is huge. huge. It's a huge step. That's major. And it, and it speaks to, you know, part of the vision. And I think we could kind of use this as a segue to talk about the summit a little bit. Mm-hmm. And is it speaks to this vision of it, of the recognition of these substances as vehicles for the sacred mm-hmm. and or opportunities for people to find more meaning and there's you know this little tiny um branch of society like the use in you know traditional native ritual though you know Mm -hmm. that federally are allowed to use certain substances but hopefully um the decriminalization at least would be a step to creating places for this kind of sacred work for broader um you know segments of society to work with it but that how that happens is very it, that's all like we don't know yet but it's a baby steps kind of thing yeah. in some ways one of the interesting things about why that law passed actually well i mean it was a lot of things but one of the guys on city council said well my grandmother used to heal with these plants mm-hmm. right uh-huh. my abuela you know like knew how these plants worked he's like it doesn't make like he can't how do i picture my grandmother as a criminal yeah right. you know when she's a healer now, 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 here's an interesting question that I have for you. Now, you, uh, Daniel, I know, I mean, I know you both have yoga in your background, but in meditation and stuff, but you specifically, you're like a yoga teacher and have a background as that. Do you, and I know that there's always been this uh, discussion, are plants a, uh, a true pathway to enlightenment or are they, a, dis- the are they a distraction? Are they a... Uh, are they, uh, because in, in the yoga world, I've gotten that a lot from my, my yoga teacher, Kundalini teacher that I've worked with for years. He's always, you know, he's of course always saying a clear and sober mind and he's not, mm-hmm. uh, 
I'm not saying, you know, go out, he tells me get up in the morning and meditate and do yoga at 4 a.m., not get up and smoke a bowl at 4.20 a.m., you know, yeah. <laughs> and, and uh, or, or whatever. But I recently, in one of his uh, writings, he actually talked, said something, just for reference, but I thought it was very interesting about, you know, plant-based uh, shamanistic practices and stuff. Just a, a slight reference, but I thought that's interesting because, like, a, in the yoga world, I've been used to there being kind of like a split, like, the plants, the drugs, that's still, like, the bad way or the wrong way. So what's, what, your, what's your opine so on that, you know? I, I've, I've got a couple of quotes. Um, so in the Yoga Sutras, they do mention plants as being a vehicle. Mm -hmm. So it's in there, right, as a potential vehicle. Um, I would also like to note that a lot of yoga teachers and meditation teachers are really happy to say, to admit that they use them. Yeah. Right? So you get, you know, past Jack Cornfield. Like, they'll all say past tense. Like, I did it then, but now I'm, I'm all grown up or something like that. So it's, it's very few and far between, although increasing in numbers, that people will admit to doing it now. I have a friend who is a Tibetan Buddhist, and he went on a retreat. You know, he goes on these week-long retreats with his group from time to time. And he was saying that more and more people are either admitting, they're admitting to doing it more than they used to. Uh -huh. um, in the tantric tradition, and this is Hindu tantra, this is like Kashmir Shaivism, this isn't like California hot tub tantra. Right. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> um, but so there's a text called the Yoga Spandakarika, which translates loosely to mean the sacred tremor or the primordial pulsation, which is kind of nice because it has a vibratory quality, which brings us back to the theme of music. So it's sort of like the first music of the world that births creation, sort of vibe to it. Uh -huh. um, and one of the, the lines in there, it says, the same phenomenon that liberates the wise enslaves the ignorant. Mm -hmm. Right? So don't blame a mushroom mm -hmm because you're either getting closer or further away. And, and the same thing ah. can happen in relation to the, with, even without psychedelics. Well, any phenomenon. Any phenomenon, like, like with meditation, it's not this experience that happens there. Mm -hmm. You know, and so you can get um, actually attached to that yeah. you know, without there being any plant substance or you know, psychedelic involved in making it there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's exactly a we, good point. We were talking in the car on the way over about the potential neurosis created by endless self-improvement. <laughs> uh-huh. Like it's like, because that happens. It's like, oh, I need to get better. I need to get more enlightened. I need to get healthier. And it's like, it creates this neurotic loop of I'm never good enough. Right, right. That's the first phrase that came in my mind, was that's what that reinforces. I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. it's, I'm it's, not there yet. It's, an, it's inherently samsaric, yeah. and it's a grasping. It's something that doesn't even exist because of the yeah. illusory nature of the self uh -huh. or some idealized self-concept, you know. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people get um, are that's connected to some of the interest, I think, in meditation and psychedelics as, mm -hmm. as like, you know, becoming, be, you know, be, becoming that ideal self. However, there are... You know, you have to step back from that and mm -hmm. also see that practicing certain things do have beneficial effects on on how you move through the world. Mm -hmm. it, it, that's not, whether you want to call that self-improvement or not, is a different, you know, notion. So the, the, the self-concept of this, this not notion this is, is illusory, mm -hmm. but the um, existence of you and how you interact with others and do things is well, not. Well, that's one of also the gifts of the psychedelic really experience. <laughs> one of the gifts of the psychedelic experience is that we do start to notice how malleable. No, no, they, they can hear us. They just said we're a little soft. Okay. Yeah. Is Fine. is that we start to notice how malleable um, our personalities are, and so there, while at the same time there can be this neurotic efforting to create some sort of idealized version of ourselves, mm -hmm. there can also be this delightful play. Mm -hmm. When we realize, like, oh, I could maybe, maybe I'll put a little energy in this direction to make myself a little bit more like this. Or maybe I'll put a little bit of energy in this direction to make myself a little bit more like right. this. And then we get to kind of delight in, uh, what do they call it at Burning Man? Um, Self-expression. Uh, yes. Right? Radical self-expression. Radical, radical, radical self-expression. Self where you get to be yourself in the most fun way for you at any given time. Uh -huh. But what you speak to right now is this malleability of self, the changeability and the, and the playfulness with it. And I think that's one point of overlap 
between um, meditation and psychedelics, you know, yes. it, that, that they're both portals to seeing mm -hmm. how, like, oh, you just changed this up, that self thing. It's just a joke, you know, or it, it's one thing that I construct and I can play with it and see it the other way. And lack of attachment to that is, is actually one source of you know, freedom and freedom. liberation. And both, you can go in both ways. Mm -hmm. and, and it is nice how syncretic and they seem to be and how they do seem to nurture each other. You know, because we do hear stories of people who meditated and meditated and had one psychedelic experience and it puts things into so much perspective. Right. And we've also heard about people who have gobbled drugs and then started to meditate and it grounded so much of that experience in a way that they could live their lives in a way that was more um, nourishing and flourishing for them right and then there's the people who in trying to make sense of their psychedelic experiences you know pursued a yogic path or mm -hmm. you know uh, people have gone back and forth on it i like to mix them I've, uh, I've, gotten, I've gotten lots of wonderful experiences doing yoga and meditation while peaking on mm -hmm. various substances over the years. Oh, mm -hmm. Did I just say that on yeah. line? <laughs> Let me, let's take this. I would like to suggest that yeah. we take this opportunity to talk about the summit a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Because it's, I do want to And also this, this because um, there's a summit going on all week. Starting the night, starting the nineteenth, September nineteenth to the twenty second. It's yeah. online, so people all over the world can watch. That's you. That's you. You like to, and you too. You Not like that things guy, online. Well, like okay, that, that guy, if you really want to. You too. To. And uh, all of you. Mm -hmm. So the tagline is celebrating the myth, magic, science, and culture of psilocybin mushrooms. Focus on psilocybin. Okay. Which, to my knowledge, is the first of its kind. Because if it had already been done, I wouldn't bother. Um, there's a coalition. Are you familiar with the 920 Coalition? Well, tell us about the 920 the, Coalition. <laughs> the, the 920 Coalition sort of wants to do for psilocybin what 420 has done for cannabis. Mm -hmm. And so they encourage people to create events in their own communities um, around psilocybin with education and you know harm reduction and maybe a cultivation workshop or who knows what. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice to... Just go for it. Now, real quick, is there a significance to the number 920? I mean, 9 looks a little like a mushroom, maybe. I don't know. I, <laughs> That's the only thing I could come up I with. I, I don't ask a lot of questions. I, I do. Know, I, yeah. I always <laughs> like to know that stuff. So, okay. Um, I, I looked at it. I don't think it's... It's just I don't because know, it's it was just chosen. the 20th I don't know why it was chosen. You can make a 9 look like a mushroom. The only thing my mind can come up with real are quick. They, are they six but, months apart? Oh. Four plus six is ten. No, it's no, not. no. So it's just, but just nine twenty. I mean, it's fine. And nine twenty. Then if you out there know nine nine twenty is right at the at the vernal Some people seem to at know. the at the autumnal equinox, yeah. you know, and oh, it kind of nice. lines up with the the uh, you know the Jewish New days. Year and uh, my birthday and uh, <laughs> I think it's because of your yeah. birthday. It's because of my birthday. Yeah. Which, by the way, there's going to be a special <laughs> episode of the Dead Headland Show on my birthday, September twenty fourth. Y'all tune in, but we'll get back to that. Okay, so back to <laughs> so back to the summit then. So, so this is something, um, just to clarify for people, um, this is an online event yes. that everybody can participate in, Correct. and uh, Thursday is free, Thursday the first is free. day is free, so even if, we're, if you just want to check it out, sign up, use the link on the Dead Headland page, and uh, sign up uh, for the Thursday free of charge. Yes. And see what this is. Or and take so, down a couple of bucks and hang out all weekend. Yeah, and so when someone signs up, what are they gonna what are they gonna get? What what are they what, gonna get? I yeah. believe at last count there are twenty nine speakers. Okay. Over the course of four days. Um, there is some science and pharmacology, there's cultivation, there's culture, there's bioremediation, we've got a couple of ceremonialists, um, you know, a, a woman in from the UK Psychedelic Society who runs retreats in Amsterdam mm -hmm. and how she creates powerful experiences for people. There's a, a high magician, like an occultist, who teaches kind of ceremonial aspects uh -huh. to things like that. We have a test pilot round table. Do you, do you know about the Baltimore <laughs> Psychedelic Society? Well, tell us about this. The no, I don't. The Baltimore Psychedelic Society is made up primarily of people who were in the John Hopkins studies. So John Hopkins University mm -hmm. did a lot of research on addiction, cancer, end-of-life anxiety, meditation, mm -hmm. and things like that. 
and you and you can go online and listen to the scientists talk. If you type in John Hopkins psilocybin into YouTube, you'll get a bajillion talks. What about the people who they gave the drugs to? Isn't anybody curious what they have to say? Yeah. So I was. Absolutely. So, so and, I and, and when were these studies done? When were these people oh, given drugs? They're continuing to happen. Yeah. They start. When did they start? Like in the night. So this is a continuous, mm -hmm. continual things, and these are people. So these aren't like people that like were part of psychedelic research back in the '60s or something. No, these are people. This, who, this is, is like recent, current stuff. A couple decades. Yeah, 2012 to now, 2010. I met Catherine in 2012 or 13. But Griffiths so had published a few studies before Catherine even started before working that, there. Yeah. yeah. But so, still, still the 21st last 20 century. years. Yeah. So we're going to have them. We've got some policy people. We've had the decriminalized nature folks coming to talk about how they, um, how they decriminalize Oakland and how they plan to do, you know, to support people in decriminalizing their communities. So if you live in a community and you would like to have nature decriminalized in yours, you can follow their guide. Um, and you'll be able to hear that at the summit. Also, we're going, if you're in the Bay Area, or have the wherewithal to travel to the Bay Area, we're going to have a few live events with Dr. Erica Rosenberg. Uh-huh. And, and Catherine McLean. And Dr. But, Catherine McLean. So yeah, these so live events are, what, when? What's well, the actual date? Friday behind? night, Friday evening. Is it 6 or 6.30 that the mushroom meditation starts? 6.30 to 9. 6.30 to 9. And um, I'm going to talk directly to you folks. To, uh, which camera is the best to look at? Just that's that the one, one that's live, the okay. one on the tall tripod okay. is live. Okay, so the mushroom meditation session that we're holding on Friday night is really an opportunity for people to work with experiences they've had with psilocybin, because that's sort of the you know general container. However, if you have any meaningful or powerful, recent or memorable psychedelic experience that you'd like to do some further work with, that's welcome too, because what we're creating is an opportunity really to um, re-explore that and make sense of it. Part of harm reduction is integration. And if you take what the word integration means, um, it means, you know, becoming part of, you know, coming together and or with respect to anything about you, it's becoming a part of you. Mm -hmm. um, and so we can have really powerful and um, sometimes confusing sometimes you know a, you know magnificent awe-inspiring experiences when we take psychedelics but was it just this thing or do we take it and and, and right. make meaning of it you know, um have it change who we are you know, who the we integration are, we is kind of like digesting something it is and uh, just for a, just a temporary side you know one time wavy gravy said you know what you shit is is whatever you don't digest you know something i mean mm -hmm. he said it much funnier than you're, that. But, you're, but, it's not that you are what you eat it's, it's not that you are what you ate it's, it's what hard. you it's, it's what you don't poop that's yeah. it's, it's what, that's you, don't it's what you don't poop it out it is it is poop. and so that's kind of it uh, kind of what the integration yeah, process yeah, is you know, so what are you going to keep from this what are you going to i'm trying to be funny they're quoting but, <laughs> yeah. but what is it you're going to make part of you yeah what do you make yeah. part of you actually i did a, a yeah. one of the, the the gifts i brought at burning man was an to this year was an opportunity for people to integrate something meaningful. And I actually um, gave them these cookies and an edible ink pen and had them write it on the cookie Whoa. and then eat it, you know, yeah. uh, because the idea is that you're really making it a part of you, you know. And yeah. so what we'll be doing, what Catherine and I are going to be doing on um, Friday night is guiding people through you know, we'll have some talking, some guided meditation, some small group work aimed at integrating um, psychedelic experience with this emphasis on, you know, psilocybin. And um, so, yeah, I mean, that's that's the general structure of the early evening event. Now, there's now, a late evening event. Now, I think yeah. about how, like, when some people on, on psilocybin and on other, other uh, journey uh, substances sometimes purge, and I'm someone that's... I'm talking about vomiting. That has purged quite a bit sometimes when I've had, like, uh, I've done some slight shamanic work in the past with different people where I've done different things. Mm -hmm. And and that is also part of, like, sometimes it's like when I can't integrate or I'm not allowing something to integrate is where that comes from. And, you know, even coming back to just somebody having a bad trip, I've always, I frequently felt when somebody thought there was something in there that was laced with something, I think it was like, no, there's something you're not 
accepting and you're resisting and your body is you're therefore, laced and, you're, and your body is therefore making you think that you're speeded out or that you're nauseous or that you're this or that but it's it, but but saying that to somebody is some oftentimes taken as con, uh, con, uh, confrontational yep. and they don't take it well mm -hmm. but usually once i found with myself once i find out what is it i'm not processing well or accepting or i'm trying to be in denial about and as soon as i do that oh, the nausea goes away or the anxiety goes away and then i have a good trip but mm -hmm. sure I, I want to say something yeah. about this notion of bad trip, uh -huh. because I think it's really important to this conversation, and certainly in harm reduction circles, we tend to not really use that talk, phrase. well, what makes it bad? I mean, it can be, some people say it's a bad trip if it's not just fun, or right. not just like, oh, I'm feeling great, then all of a sudden I start focusing on this thing, and it freaked me out, and I realized my life had no meaning, and that everything about me was materialistic, yeah. and you know, that's the kind of stuff that can lead to... A very unpleasant experience yeah. so part of integration actually is like okay yeah that maybe wasn't what you signed up for whatever but is there something in there um, that you can make meaning of yeah. and it and sometimes the most meaningful insights come from experiences so, whether psychedelically induced or not that are, the most that are aversive or right you know, it's funny because I use the word bad trip a lot as kind of a colloquialism to refer to that. And, and if you remember, there used to be a, a, a term for certain people that seemed a little burnt out, acid casualty. And I, uh, when I started um, doing some work with a, a shamanic healer and doing various psychedelic work, the people that to me were the casualties were the ones that had an experience that they hadn't integrated. Mm -hmm. And they had something in, in, in that to... Uh, like the work like the Zendo projects yeah. and stuff does is is really that's a big part of harm reduction is so that when someone does have like the ultimate freak out and I'm also a big fan of like bad 60s psychedelic cinema like psych out and the trip and stuff where they show people having these bad psych outs and <laughs> colors and oh my god there's shit happening that's and what stuff. they and showed like, us in elementary love, school I love that stuff so I'm going to do I'm going to do a show on psych, um, psychedelic cinema because I'm a I'm a big fan of a lot of that especially the really bad stuff right? What? Can we do it live in Marin? I'd like to do screenings yeah, at some point. Yeah, 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 that'd be, but you know, you have to get, I, I have a lot of these things on DVD, but you kind of have to get permission to actually like show them publicly and stuff. Right. But we could do parties. We could do psychedelic cinema parties yeah. upstairs in the Marco Vision Theater. Trust me, this, there is, you go. this is all on the agenda. Yeah. You might not be invited. I do want to talk about, <laughs> we can put a but, pin in it, but I want to talk about accountability. Okay. Point. Yes. All right, so so yeah, yeah. Let's yeah, let's talk just talk about it. Come back. Yeah, talk talk, talk, about about, it now. talk about that. I had a point <laughs> that I lost, but that's now. okay. That all comes so back up. So one of the nice things, now. So one of the nice things about like an integration circle or a community that has is consciously psychedelic. You know, we're talking about having these bad and difficult experiences because our life has no meaning, right? <laughs> Potentially, right? Oh my God, my life has no meaning. I hate my job. I'm selling something that kills people, or you know, <laughs> and and I want to make a change. And then, and I feel, and then I, you commit to making that change, you know, an hour five or something like mm -hmm. that. And then you feel amazing and you're like in flow with the universe and there's all just like glory and light. And then you're really committed to that for like the next five days. But, then, that. <laughs> but then you realize that it's hard mm -hmm. and that you don't have the skill set and you don't have the support and the road is tricky. So to, to, to what Ram Dass would say is you eventually come down. You always come down. <laughs> but the thing is, is so, so one of the things that, that I have, that I like to talk about is that if you want to stay connected to the source, you have to serve the source. Mm -hmm. So which means you have to do the work. So that road is, is a tough one to hoe, but it's workable and it's doable, but it also requires support. Mm -hmm. So part of the reason that an integration circle or an integration community is important is that we get to hold each other accountable and we get to support each other in that journey, uh -huh. right? So it's not just support around the fact that like, oh man, you had a big time or a bummer of a time. It's that like, I have a vision for my life and I'm having a tough time trying to figure out how to live that and build the skills for it. Uh -huh. So we're hold so that sort of accountability to the fact that you can, like I believe that you can have a meaningful life and I will support you in doing that. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very yeah, interesting. I feel yeah. like I should get off the soapbox. I get a little fired up. Yeah, no, but yeah, that's... Yeah, but you know, that's, I mean, that's it's like, that's, that's what we need yeah. anyway, all mm -hmm. the time. I mean, even if you look at, the, you know, traditional spiritual paths and mm -hmm. in Buddhism, you know, you talk about, you need, you know, like, not just the teachings, mm -hmm. you know, not just the, the teacher, you know, you need the practices, you need the teacher, but you need the community. Right. And 
and having a supportive community is key. And so this is, this is what moves me about what we're talking mm -hmm. about here is actually creating community because right. like with the Zendo project, one of the things. Pause for one moment. Just a